for one. <laughs> so, uh, so this uh, session is the fourth session of the day, focusing on foresight city region 3.0. Uh, the aims of the session are to explore three overarching questions and to plan a program of co-production. So you can understand from the name that it will be an interactive session. So we'll be discussing questions like, what would a Foresight City Region 3.0 look like in 2050 in different places, different cities, different spaces? Um, so cities are, again, important places where most of the, uh, as we discussed, uh, socioeconomic life um, take place. So it is important to look at their future and then understand because city futures are pretty much corresponds with uh, humanity futures. So what can we learn from the pandemic as it goes by and which pathways can lead to this goal based on collective foresight intelligence. So we will try to see a demonstration of this collective foresight intelligence by putting our heads together uh, through these online platforms. Uh, so we have very distinguished participants uh, in this uh, session, uh, <laughs> starting with uh, Joe uh, Ravitz from the University of Manchester, UK. Uh, very short introductions, and we have Gechi Karri Sevina. I hope Gechi is with us already. So uh, she is from South Africa with School of Governance, and we have Wendy here, Wendy Schultz, Infinite Futures, Sami, the UK, Fabiana Scapolo, European Commission Director General Joint Research Center. Uh, she is also joining us, and then we have Ian Miles here and from the Higher School of Economics and the University of Manchester. So uh, without further delay, I just hand it over to Joe to explain our um, approach and methodology for this process for today's session, which will consist of some uh, presentations, a set of presentations from our distinguished speakers, and then a session on co-production, which is an interactive session on pilot projects. Joe. Great, great. Thanks, Oshan. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, and thanks particularly to speakers uh, for, you know, stepping up and sending things and so on. They're very much appreciated. Um, first thing is, it's really helpful to us if everyone can put their name into the chat and maybe a couple of words about, you know, their interest or something. Um, and then we can look at this later and then hopefully, you uh, as we follow through, contact you, if you don't mind, <clears throat> and, um, and and follow through. So if I may share my screen, hopefully this is working. Uh, and um, I'd like to introduce, uh, firstly, uh, the the general idea of this Foresight 3.0. I think for, uh, Ostrand has already said a few words in the previous session. So thanks for, for doing that. Um, and then how the session runs and why are we here and how, do, how does it apply to the particular case of cities and regions? Very practical. We all live in them. So let's put, place the Foresight 3.0 grand idea into something very practical. Um, I, my sh uh, screen is working OK, Ashton? It is, it is working, yes. OK, yes. great. Okay. So, well, a quick recap, <laughs> uh, because I started this journey about uh, 12 months ago and I uh, was drawing pictures of the corona problem. Uh, and, um, and then 12 months later, what have we learned? Well, we can start to draw some conclusions. And one is, oh, if we just use linear thinking, first we, we open up the economy, uh, great, but then the, the health cases grow and, uh, oh my God, we have to shut down the economy and then the health cases might come down and so on. In other words, this is really not a very intelligent way to live with this virus, whether it's here short term or medium term or long term, nobody really knows. Uh, one reaction is to believe no one and everything. And here you see, you know, the rabbit hole effect, uh, the no vaxxers and no 5G and so on and so on. Another equally opposite reaction is to say, oh, we had better divide the city and the society into zones of safety and risk, high uh, uh, and value, high value, low value. 
and so on. And here you see, you know, a picture of the city. This is more or less a map of Manchester at the moment. I could elaborate on another time. Uh, so is there a way forward which really uh, uses the best of human knowledge and human imagination, running foresight, large, small, local, uh, international, and, and so on, to find a way to live with this virus thing? Now, the virus is only one of a long list of challenges, as we know. So uh, given the fact that uh, cities and regions are on the front line, how can they best respond and think more strategically than they do already? How can they use the imagination of their citizens? How can they unlock the incredible potential of entrepreneurs and, and all the enterprises and so on and so on? So that is the broad uh, context. And then as a contribution, we started to evolve this 3.0 kind of idea and the notion of collective strategic intelligence, meaning, oh, OK, we know it when it's not there, when things are really stupid and everybody is unjoined up and government departments cannot even understand each other, let alone talk to each other. Uh, and the private sector is completely disconnected from any social responsibility and so on and so on. So all of this adds up to a foresight model. And well, we're trying it here and there. We have sessions on AI, we've had sessions on uh, social innovation and empowerment. Uh, and this is one particular session where we thought, OK, it's time now to come back to the city and regional question. And if we say, what are the applications of this collective anticipatory intelligence? Well, one is inside the foresight process, meaning, yeah, if we get our act together as practitioners, best data, best methods, best applications, best you know, imagination, and so on. But the other part of it is outside the process, where how many of us as practitioners have done a great exercise and then, you know, the policymaker says thanks and puts it on the shelf. Or even worse, halfway through, they change the uh, goalpost and you have to struggle to get your fee and, <laughs> and so on. This has happened to me more than once. Uh, so, again, then the foresight process has to look around at the, uh, the client, the society around it and say, OK, can we help that society to grow its collective anticipatory intelligence? So that's the broad context. Uh, then, well, as I mentioned, we have these experimental 1, 2, 3D spaces. Uh, if you follow the links, it's in the um, on the briefing paper website and, and so on. I'll put it back in the chat in a moment. Um, and you'll see already the slides are on this mural whiteboard at the top. Uh, and also there is the beginning of an exploration, in other words, a lab test of a model for a Foresight City 3.0 in the centre of this map. Um, and also, where there are slides, we encourage people to comment, ask questions, critique, spin off, put in examples, links, other things. Uh, and if you really don't like a slide, well, yeah, say so. We would like to know. So again, we're trying to expand the normal kind of channel of communication out from the, uh, how do we say, you know, traditional show and tell, you know, expert stands up, shows 20 minutes of PowerPoints. Uh, and then there's a couple of questions and then the next expert stands up. We think there is much more that can be done. And especially if we're doing foresight processes, we need the best imagination that we can get. Uh, and this is why also we introduce the 3D space. This is an experimental zone uh, constructed uh, actually for another project, but you can see from the site map, um, there is a SmartWise corner that's focused on the technology. Uh, there's an EcoWise corner uh, uh, focused on sustainability and a four-wise corner. This is focused on the four site. So this, these represent three main branches. Oh, there's also a main screen where we show you know, movies and things. Um, these represent the three main streams of our emerging laboratory for collective intelligence. And I say emerging, we, the, the plan is evolving, you know, kind of week by week. 
uh, but it's looking very interesting so far, and I invite you to join um, this, uh, not only this event, but you know, the follow up to this one and maybe other events too. So then, well, sorry, writing's a bit small. We introduced a scenario. Well, let's say Ian Miles, who is here, he's a great, you know, scenario thinker and, um, you know, futures um, aficionado, I think. Uh, so he said, well, I think we should have a scenario. Fine. So the scenario in this case, it's described in more detail in the briefing paper, which is on the event website. Again, I'll put the link in the chat in case anyone needs it. Um, but the, uh, the scenario name is called Mosaic, Massive Multi-Agent Online Scenario Appraisal Colloquies. <laughs> uh, I'd have to think about that. But it's basically, uh, yeah, we get AI and big data to do the job for us of foresight, of trend analysis, horizon scanning, uh, uh, VR um, modeling of uh, digital twins, and um, uh, you can interact with your future self or your past self, because it's all online, of course, and so on and so on. So the short question is, how can this amazing thing really work? And then the, the, the more interesting question is, what could possibly go wrong, or at least be unforeseen? Because, of course, you can look at the list on the right hand side of, oh, wow, we could do this, we could do that. Fantastic. Wow. Uh, but we know from examples already, yes, you know, well, we have put urban planning, for example, online. You know, you can look up documents that is much more efficient than ever before. But do we really have a better planning system? Um, not really. Not in the UK arguably. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, OK, so what are we missing? And as you can see from the little cartoon, uh, the future is, how, is here now. It's all mixed up. And is it deeply problematic when we have robots, you know, that then tell the humans what they can or can't do? So that's in the kind of background of the scenario thinking. Uh, we have a case study. Uh, and I'll just say Mark Tudor Jones was one of the leaders of this case study. Uh, I believe I did a, the report on um, environment, on sustainability, uh, and uh, this um, diagram <coughs> was put in uh, into the final reports, and they identified two current challenges in long-term thinking about UK city futures. Okay, there's the scenario, typical, you know, textbook uh, trumpet, uh, probable, plausible, possible, and so on. Uh, well, one challenge is the trumpet gets more and more interesting after 25 years or more. But one challenge is, well, beyond 25 years, city planners really don't want to go there. It's, it's just too fuzzy. Even though they are putting in infrastructure like roads, railways, airports, which will be there for a long time more than 25 years. But it's, it's kind of too difficult. It's too risky. Hostage to fortune, as uh, the chief planner of um, the Department of Environment once uh, told me. Um, and then uh, the other challenge, even more great, is to say, oh, challenge two, non-probable, non-business as usual, infrequently considered in city futures. So for example, the pandemic, well, that was, it was on all the uh, you know, uh, foresights and uh, risk assessments and so on. Um, did the city planners take this into account? Nope not in the UK. Uh, so there we have it, you know, not to blame city planners, they're all, you know, kind of doing the best they can. Uh, but, you know, the, the way that the institution is configured, it doesn't quite work. So again, the big practical question is, what can we contribute, you know, back to those people out there on the front line, so to say. Uh, and well, <clears throat> just put this table in also from the final report of this project. Benefits of city foresight, local strengths, resilience, strategy, investor confidence, strategic partnerships, tackling challenges, civic engagement. What is not to like, as they say, but then what could possibly go wrong? Why does this not work? Even when people try it, there are deep problems. Now, also in reality, yeah, there are many different versions, very, you know, a thousand different flowers based on similar ideas are blooming all over the place. So it's not to say that foresight you know, is you know, the truth and everybody else is wasting their time. Rather, I think to say that foresight has 
a really powerful set of insights uh, and a really big contribution to make, particularly in the age that we live, where we are turbulent, even chaotic, and so on. Um, so this is, again, the reason for wanting to explore. Well, some people say, well, what is this 3.0 thing? Well, here is a kind of very brief summary. Uh, Foresight one, the problems are basically quite short term, quite functional, and we try to fix them. So if we need 5,000 houses, great. Where do we put 5,000 houses? A mode two is more like a kind of, well, you could say it is evolutionary, neoliberal maybe, uh, competition, innovation, incentives. So if we have 5,000 houses, how do we improve the value of those 5,000 houses? It's a market question, incentive and psychology question. Uh, and that's fine. But we could say, well, actually, the humans in here, they're not only like little, you know, machines that need houses, they are humans. Uh, they look for livable communities. Uh, and these livable communities cannot be just built by a developer, they have to emerge. But the developers and planners and architects maybe can help. <clears throat> so if we conceive of the building of 5,000 houses, not just as a material operation, but as a kind of um, <clears throat> emergence, a collaboration, even a so-called collective urban intelligence, where all of the stakeholders involved need to learn from each other. So that's the kind of short uh, answer. How this applies to four city or foresight city, we're struggling for the right word here actually, uh, co-futures. Um, well, we look for enhanced scanning, enhanced systems analysis. Uh, we work with people, practitioners out there, as I'm doing myself at the moment, and say, OK, maybe we could draw a map of your little problem here. How would that work? Does that help? You know, and so there's a, 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 a responsive kind of mode of inquiry, appreciative inquiry and um, elaboration of possibilities and so on. If I came in and said, oh, let's just, you know, run a foresight exercise and everybody must join in. Well, I would be wasting my time in those. So again, uh, we look for ways forward, which are not necessarily uh, in the textbooks, not necessarily easily defined, but we, we know what we are trying to do. Um, so, well, then there's um, <clears throat> a couple of pictures. These are on the whiteboard, by the way. So I do encourage to, you know, if I jump through these very quickly, you can have a look on the whiteboard while, you know, you're doing things and answering emails and so on. But this just tries to visualize, you know, the difference between the one on 2.0 and the 3.0. And on the 3.0 side, yeah, our problem definition is much wider. Uh, we do not assume that we know everything about what is going on or even how to define the problem. We, we, we assume that we are looking at transformations rather than simply growing, you know, uh, uh, simply adding 5,000 houses into this city, for example. Uh, and to do this, creative thinking is the way forward. Here's some examples. Um, and more examples are now, you know, digital. This is the reason for doing this thing today. Um, we also have to talk about government. Well, I guess we lost the connection with Joe. Or probably I'm disconnected. Joe, do you hear me? We don't hear you. Uh, okay, as far as I understand, we lost Joe because I see everybody else uh, 
moving in the screen and Joe is frozen. So that means he's actually uh, disconnected. Hi. Hi, Joe, do you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, I was about to come back to you because we are probably uh, slightly running out of time. So just to give an oh. opportunity to oh. our speakers, maybe we can just wrap up and move on. Yes, um, but please uh, continue. Uh, I will catch up. We hear you. You can hear me. Yes, I oh, see okay. you. Yeah, <laughs> we see that you are. <laughs> okay. Typing. Well, I'll, I'll skip uh, the, 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 you know, the rest of the systems analysis because uh, you can, as many of you have seen it before in some way, and I think you can catch up on the whiteboard, etc. Et but just to, if I just uh, scroll to the end uh, of this particular thing, um, well, uh, there are uh, examples from the urban planning scene, uh, from uh, local economic development, uh, from uh, there's a systems summary, which looks like that, and um, and then more exploration of, you know, how to find the elephant in the room. And, and so on and so on. And finally to say, this is one of a series. Through this series, we are trying to uh, build up. This is not just a one-off event and then we'll go away and you know that's it. We're trying to build up a body of knowledge and practice. And over the course of this year, uh, we want to identify a number of case studies with a number of important themes. And hopefully people can say, yeah, that's something I'm working on. Maybe I could contribute. So we'll gather together different people around different themes uh, and aim towards a output. And it's just a complete coincidence that uh, Professor Oschan here is the editor of a journal. Well, I never would have thought. Uh, so we thought, okay, maybe we could aim our outputs towards a special issue in that journal uh, and surround it with other non-academic things or more informal things, which can take place on a variety of channels. So I, I do hope that uh, many of you here can be part of that process, uh, which I'm sure will add huge value to everything that you are doing. Uh, and I'll come back to that at the, in the part two after, what would it be, um, four o'clock your time. There is the interactive session part two, uh, which um, I, a bit more can be explained. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, for the um, thank you for the introduction. So the interactive session will be begin in about an hour, an hour and five minutes. So we can, right. will be about 5 p.m. Uh, our time and uh, 3 p.m. your time, probably. Yeah. So uh, now um, I guess we can uh, move on based on this background that Joe's provided to us. So I'd like to invite now uh, Gechi to talk about for site for cities and regions, and more, of course. Keche, the <laughs> screen is yours. Great to Thank see you. you. Good to see you too. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I am going to attempt to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Super, it's working. So uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. I'm not sure where everybody is. Uh, I, I believe I'm just an hour apart from those who are in Moscow. Sorry, I don't know why they started at the end. Uh, really excited to follow up uh, from where Joe left off because the ideas of Foresight 3.0 uh, in my own work have been really exciting uh, to the extent that, and one of the questions you were asked is what can we learn from COVID? Uh, in my context in Africa and uh, a lot of my work on the future of cities in Africa, I think uh, if there's anything positive that could be claimed to have come from COVID, it's really been the opening up of the question, the willingness to uh, appreciate and accept that perhaps we weren't entirely sure what we were doing, uh, and perhaps the solutions are not all there, uh, and perhaps the questions are much more open-ended. Perhaps we are not even asking the right questions, and I think Joe has alluded to all of this. So I thought what I would share today are just some of those thoughts in terms of um, how we in this talk of decolonizing, which scares some people because they think we're talking about literally colonization. I think you'll see we're talking more about decolonizing the future 
than the question of who colonized the past. Uh, and I like to use this image uh, that we came up from with in one of our workshops where we said, well, if you think about colonizing the future, uh, it's really got to do with imagination and what we think the limits uh, of possibility are. And often we find, you know, when people ask me to come and speak about the future of African cities, uh, uh, often what I will find is that there's a very particular idea that people already hold uh, about what is possible in the future. And often it's painting a vision, and I think Joe has spoken very well to this, that really isn't that different from where we are coming from and probably uh, even accentuates some of the problems uh, uh, as we go from the small bowl to the big box. Uh, so what have we been talking about in this regard? And sorry, I see this little image is here. And there's a website there for those who are interested. We've been talking about uh, when we use foresight and when we begin to engage with people about the future, and particularly when we do it as experts, those who know how to think about the future, the combination of that, as well as the set of tools perhaps that we insist are the tools for engaging with the future, as well as a sense that we in fact can see the future and begin to suggest pathways, some of which are compulsory. It seems to be the only choices we can make because they're the only ones within the realm of plausibility, uh, or they appear to be the most optimal ones, meaning that we have a sense of what's the best thing to be done in this case, begins to impose three levels of what we call coloniality into the future. The idea that we colonize intellectually and institutionally uh, 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 by insisting that only some people have the power to future or to, or, or to do foresight. Uh, the idea that procedurally, in terms of how we do anticipation, that there are only a finite acceptable set of ways for doing that, as opposed to appreciating a wider context of anticipatory cultures that I believe almost every culture in the world has. So there's an issue there, and there's a wonderful word, epistemicide, this idea of killing other ways of knowing, other ways of, uh, of developing knowledge. Uh, but then also the political and societal coloniality that then comes with creating a, a very finite set of what the future can be. Uh, and, and, and that's taken us essentially into this much more messy diagram that I won't go into here, but you can read about uh, on that website, where we say that those three kinds of colonization when it comes to the future uh, really begin to create all sorts of limitations, but can be counted purposefully through a number of procedures that we are suggesting such as the idea of co-design, where you challenge those worldviews by involving people, uh, integrating people in process. The idea of action research, which is more about questioning and learning by doing rather than learning with answers in the pocket. Uh, this idea of transdisciplinarity and ultimately collective intelligence. And if you are listening carefully to Joe, this might sound very familiar because I believe this is what uh, uh, Foresight 3.0, in fact, invites and begins to speak on. So I think just perhaps to say there's a wonderful synergy between how we see uh, Foresight for the future, and particularly where we are right now, uh, uh, perhaps being uh, uh, the space we're investing time into. Um, and what does this mean uh, in terms of pathways for the future of cities? So this is, again, one of the small sketches we use where we talk about it moves us from thinking about development as a preordained path to a future that's known, uh, uh, and, and we have the power to do that, to a different kind of approach that really allows for much more emergent themes that, in fact, expand, not reduce choice and agency. Uh, and again, here, I think you'll see very much the language and thinking of Foresight 3.0, uh, and the idea of alternative pathways that can be created through different forms of engagement. I have for a long time argued that uh, there are three levels of decolonizing we would need to do. The first being the decolonizing of the imagination, and this is very powerful, particularly when we speak of space and cities, because in fact there are often some very strong images and imaginaries we have about what it means to be a city or what it means to be a town uh, and what buildings look like and what lifestyle in space look like. And so how do we have new thinking in those spaces? The issue of processes, how do we imagine city making differently? Again, Joe has given some beautiful examples as a planner, as an architect. We know there are many challenges. Uh, uh, and so when we talk about co-creation, co-production, it's not something, in fact, that we do very well. Uh, so again, how do, how do new processes perhaps enable different futures? Uh, and then, of course, institutionally, how do we allow for new ways of doing things? So 
having argued for these, I'm going to close with my example because you were asked what are some examples of this kind of work. Uh, and I wanted to share this one that we've been doing. Uh, we did uh, actually over the last two years, we've concluded this phase now, but I think it can go nicely actually into a City 3.0 exercise. And these were visualization studios that focused on that idea of decolonizing process. So how could you work with residents of a city? And we worked with residents of nine cities across South Africa last year. Uh, we did it virtually because of the pandemic. Uh, and what it was really trying to do was to unearth these collective imaginaries that really didn't take as a starting point uh, some imposed idea of what cityness means or what must be important to people. Uh, that led us to really amazing and diverse renderings of what cities could look like. And you'll see from, I love this example just because there's very little of it that looks like a traditional architectural rendering of a city, but there's a lot of power in the imaginaries that people have pulled into this kind of an image and ultimately led to these kinds of um, themes where people could begin talking about the future of their spaces. And we found a real richness in what people chose to speak of. They chose to speak of healing and community uh, enablement in very different ways that could still feed and inform policy and planning but with a very different intent, a very different spirit, if you have a moment to read some of these comments, uh, that you know, you know, we're putting Band-Aids on bullet wounds. Now, which architect or planner could ever have come up with that? And what is the implication of saying that to somebody who's then doing development in a space when communities are articulating that as being what's important to them about their space? So that's just an example coming from our context, uh, playing with process and co-production. Uh, I believe very much that the perception that we hold of the future and the processes, the practices we enact about the future, in fact, can colonize the future of ourselves and the futures of others. Uh, and therefore, I really welcome the opportunity to experiment much more liberally, I think, with some of these ideas of foresight. And, and, and Foresight 3.0, I think, is a really useful framing and an open door. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Gechi, thank you very much for the excellent intervention. Really uh, very inspirational. Uh, thank you again. We'll have you back later. Um, so now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Professor Mark Tudor Jones. Um, apologies, actually, we uh, didn't include, we missed your name in the uh, conference program, but you are now here and with us. Thanks for being uh, available. Uh, so, um, Mark uh, is a professor of cities and regions uh, at the uh, Bartlett Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, Faculty of the Built Environment, University College London. So, uh, Mark, so I pass the screen to you now. Thanks very much, Ajkan. I don't have slides, uh, just to give you a little uh, bit of a respite from staring at the screen. Uh, so I'll just use my minutes talking about some some principles. And it's really good to, to be involved with this panel and, and to be involved with this uh, conference as well. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, why foresight is important in terms of cities and regions, but also the challenges, and I know that some of this discussion you've already had about how we try and think about long-term change for cities, but we're in a context where governments increasingly want to think short-term and also want to perhaps uh, be in a situation where they are not challenged about existing policy and existing interventions. So I'm going to make my points with reference to a case study um, called Newcastle City Futures. And before I rejoined UCL last year, I ran something called Newcastle City Futures at Newcastle University in the north of the UK, which was one of the uh, future of cities foresight examples that Joe had mentioned that has been sponsored by the UK government a few years ago. And I ran that for five years. So in many ways, even though I'm a scientist, I was right in the middle of trying to develop futures for that city and region with uh, a range of sectors outside the academy and in this context of trying to make long-term gains in a very short-term context. Um, when we think about cities and regions, of course, it's not just about the key issues that we expect to find, issues about climate change or transport infrastructure or affordable housing. The issue about cities and regions is that all these issues 
are there and come into play with each other. And that's the biggest challenge about foresight for cities and regions is the interrelationships and interactions between these competing agendas. And if you factor in then all the agencies and audiences who expect cities to deliver back for them, you can see how much it's a, it's a contentious issue trying to carve out a vision and trajectory uh, for the future. As Joe mentioned, and Getchi, that that the more complex we issues that we have, the more it becomes obvious that single responses or single agency responses cannot do it all. So it's not just about government, it's not just about business, it's not even just about communities or even us as members of the academy. We all have to find ways of working together to understand what's going on, but also think about where we might go. And the idea of changing policy direction to meet those bigger wicked problem goals is slightly problematic because institutions like governments, let alone universities, take an enormous amount of time to change direction. They're like an oil tanker. They get stuck. And persuading them to change a course of direction, a different path, is immensely challenging. It only happens when there's a shock to the system. And something like COVID has been a terrible shock to the system, which has prompted city governments to change direction very rapidly indeed. The question is, will that be a change for long term or will it revert back to other ways of doing it? The other point to say is we're also operating in the context where even though we believe perhaps in foresight and foresight 3.0, there's a greater degree of skepticism about science. And it's certainly about experts. And that's certainly true of the UK, where there's been growing criticism about scientists and judgments about the value of their expertise, the value of science, the value of data, which makes it very difficult for us to be in a position of trying to convince others, politicians included, about the relevance of our work and the relevance of adopting these methodologies um, as well. So what this means is, if we're going to work on long-term problems in cities and regions, they will be less linear, less discrete, and also more challengeable as well. So the, if we are going to employ foresight and try our best to do it, the question is, who initiates foresight? For what purpose is it intended? And where will it sit in the wider context of government, society, and scientific expertise. Those questions need to be addressed before we even begin to embark on a foresight exercise. Now, having worked on the Newcastle experience, I've learned some issues on the back of it, and I probably got greyer in the process because it was an immense challenge to do, and I did age considerably, as you can tell uh, by it as well. But I, I came up with these principles, and they might be useful for the discussion going on. Adopt a working method for mapping and scenario work with regards to context and place and time. This is not an off the shelf set of principles. These have to be embedded in particular cities and regions to make them workable and observable. What you want is it to be a trusted device and method for everyone outside the academy to say it's useful. That means it has to be relevant to what they can see in their own city and region. So adaptability is very important. The second issue is, how is it legitimized? Who legitimizes the foresight exercise? Is this something that just academics do? Or is it external to government partners who embark on it? And how does government react? So what legitimacy does it have to do the work, because that's important to communicate to participants about the value of the work coming out from foresight. Where does it go to? Who's going to use it? Think about those things up front. The third point, think about the long term. So having a 2050, 2060 perspective is really useful because you can avoid short term election cycles. You can avoid the here and now by constantly getting people to think about the long-term futures as a destination and as a goal for discussion. Mapping work is really important. 
And that has to be about the positives and negatives of a city and region. You can't hide from the negatives about all the downsides of what's going on in a place, as well as the positives. The combination of positive and negatives about an individual place will speak about the likely set of scenarios that could be developed, which leads ultimately to possible intervention and policy change. And that means admitting to failures about what went wrong in the past. Uh, just because something was successful in 1990 or 2000 doesn't mean it could be workable today because time and place changes demonstrably. So there has to be a backcasting exercise about how did we get here and from where and where we might be likely to go in the future. Everyone participating must be made aware of the purpose of foresight and uh, what will happen to the outcomes. And that means adopting a range of tools. Getchy mentioned about a range of creative methods. That's absolutely the case. You need to have a range of creative methods that are deployed at different stages in order to carry on and get, keep momentum in the discussion. And that could include, for example, high use of visualizations, imagery, filmic work, anything that's not policy wording and certainly not academic speak, because that will be the ultimate way that you turn off people and they won't buy into what you're doing. Final few points, and then I'll stop. Because of the complexity of cities and the array of different actors who together provide services in cities, a foresight exercise for a city really needs to be a collaborative effort. It needs to be a way that different agencies can work together. And I found certainly in Newcastle that I spent a lot of my time just doing the joining up, not being the scientist telling people the evidence, but actually coercing them into working together. So I think for cities, for people in foresight, we need to take on the role of facilitators, enablers to understand the evidence and data and science, make them meaningful and visible, but also find ways that we can work together as well. It's about opening up the conversations, not closing them down. Just because new conversations don't fit existing policy and don't fit existing ways of academic thinking doesn't mean to say that they're not valuable. They are valuable because that's where transformation and innovation is going to come from rather than existing ways of looking at the world. So don't close down discussions just because it doesn't relate to the here and now. Work on impediments and the difficulties, and there will always be those, but save them for later. And what we're talking about really is a cycle of conversations, not a linear process which will lead to an end point, but a continual cycle of conversations and methods to be brought to bear. And failure, as well as success, will be part of that process. But your job is essentially to keep the momentum and spirit of doing things going all the way through. Above all, in cities, for this sort of method, my experience is shared outcomes are the most valuable and they need to be celebrated as joint efforts as well. So if you are working in the space of a range of different actors, the outcomes can be shared by all, and that in turn supports the method, supports the exercise you've done, and will involve more people than wanting to join the activity as time goes on. Uh, and I think I've overshot my time anyway, but thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for this uh, excellent points and insights from your uh, experience. We greatly appreciate that. So um, uh, we are now moving uh, to Wendy, Wendy Schultz. Um, Wendy will talk about emerging methods, tools, processes, and know-how, and then we'll see if we can apply them to our future's thinking. Wendy. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. I do have a few slides, mostly to keep me on point. Um, and would just say that I, I think this, um, this panel is bringing you a very coherent, um, sorry, very coherent message in a lot of ways, uh, which is interesting. So one of the it's things. Not surprising. 
<laughs> Joe, you uh, you had a cunning plan, I can tell, <laughs> this particular group of people. Um, so one of the challenges is to talk a little bit about how COVID changes the context. So I'd like to start off with a, a quote from the science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson. The virus is rewriting our imaginations. What felt impossible has become thinkable. We're getting a different sense of our place in history. We know we're entering a new world. We seem to be learning our way into a new structure of feeling. And so I'm here to tell you what I think is the good news. And it's possibly a little bit perverse, but the pandemic era in uh, my experience and from talking to the rest of the futures community and presumably the foresight community embedded within that is that the pandemic era has been very, very good to us. And in many ways, looking back on 40 years of um, work in future studies and foresight, this is really the golden age of distributed decentralized futures explorations. And an awful lot of doors are opening that we might not have imagined in the past. And many doors are opening that should have been opened long ago. And what I'd like to briefly do, because I'm not a city planner, I'm not an urban planner, um, and I'm coming here primarily to talk a little bit about uh, methods and tools, because I kind of collect futures and foresight methods and activities rather like a, a magpie collecting shiny things. Mm -hmm. um, so what for me maybe begins as a base is what I think of as the three fives of futures fluency. And this is a bit of a work in progress, but roughly speaking, when we're engaged in futures thinking, we're enhancing our own and, and others' awareness of change. We're engaging in a critical look at change, at its impacts, who is bearing the weight and cost of those impacts, who is um, benefiting from and being empowered by them. We're exploring alternative possible futures, of course. That's frequently what uh, futures researchers are best known for, right? Scenario exploration. Envisioning and negotiating preferred futures and acting to create change in the present, because if we're not changing what we do in this moment and this moment and this moment, then all of the rest of it is um, creative imagination, but uh, but really has no particular impact on on creating different futures. And there are an, an, a range of mental skills that we have to engage in this. It's not all about logical extrapolation and logical forecasting. There's obviously a lot of creative thinking involved in really coming up with vivid, provocative, challenging images of alternative possibilities in the future. We need to think systemically, and by that I mean um, make those interconnections that Mark was talking about, think across and around and beyond the bounds of different disciplines, um, think critically about our own assumptions and biases and the assumptions and biases that are built into the structures and ways of uh, approaching things in the world and institutions, and think empathically about what we do uh, engaging in futures research, what impacts that has, how different people in, engage in it, um, and, and avoid essentially epistemicide, which is a fantastic new word. But the other thing that we have to bear in mind when we're engaging in futures thinking, foresight, forecasting, futures exploration, all of this, is that we don't approach these ideas with a neutral emotional perspective, that we come to our thinking about the future with our curiosity involved, looking at and looking for novelty, novelties. Hopefully we come with our senses of humor engaged to give us a little perspective on the relative importance of, of what we're considering and the, the various different um, enriching contradictions that are in thinking through uh, intersecting issues and, and their impacts in terms of change. I hope that we come to this with a sense of awe, uh, both that, that 
combination of humility and wonder about how truly very different the future could be and how that might be both completely wonderful and completely terrible. A sense of forgiveness because so many mistakes have been made in the past. We hope to make fewer in the future or at least different mistakes in the future, but that means that we have to come to the future with a sense of forgiveness and quite frankly, a sense of love for what is possible and uh, a willingness to embrace and be very open in thinking about the future. So when we talk about engaging people broadly, we have to remember we're engaging the whole person. And I caught a little bit, uh, Ozan, of the, um, of the previous session, at, at right at the end there, you were talking about the senses, right? What does the future smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Is it, is it a harsh wind against your skin or is it a soft breeze? You know, what are you hearing in the future? And I think that's part of it as well. So the point of all of that is that that brings us to, you know, this amazing moment we are experiencing. And I'm sure throughout history, people have said, this is a stunning moment of high turbulence and chaos. And so this happens to everybody. But this is our stunning moment of turbulence. And the turbulence of this present moment is rewriting the possible future second by second by second. So the possibility spaces of the outcomes from this chaos are shaped by sensitive dependence on initial conditions. That's what chaos theory tells us. What we need to learn from that is that we can be those differing initial conditions. Each of us has the potential to be the butterfly that flaps its wings. So what are different ways we can enact Foresight 3.0? So some of the differentiating characteristics between Foresight 3.0 and, and what Joe has elaborated as Foresight 1.0 and 2.0 is that Potentially, in its best form, it would be distributed, decentralized, participatory, diverse, systemic, emergent, and I'm sure there are other distinguishing characteristics, but this was my first stab. And by distributed, we're already seeing some interesting um, approaches to doing that in distributing horizon scanning and the awareness of change across um, kind of team and community hubs, and there are a variety of different software platforms that let you do that. We're decentralizing, massively decentralizing, collecting not only signals of change across populations, but images of the future and narratives of the future by uh, the potential for using crowdsourcers and, um, and interconnected um, communications and computing platforms. We're getting much better and more creative, quite frankly, about participatory approaches to futures in terms of building um, interactive games, um, experiential exhibits that people can walk into new ideas about the future. Seven Siblings from the Future is an example from um, Finland Citra. Diverse, there has been a stunning, and, uh, and, and Getchy embodied this and, and explained the work um, and, and the approaches she's taking and her colleagues are taking. Um, there's been some really stunning work in getting much more deeply and expansively into decolonizing the future in the last 10 years or so. And I, I say that as someone who first heard the phrase um, from Zia Sardar, you know, in the sort of 90s, the focus on decolonizing the future. Systemic, the, the notion that we do understand that all of these problems are linked and interconnected, that you can't talk about, for example, vulnerability of women and children without talking about climate change and the stress it puts on systems and what that does to conflict and how conflict uh, creates even greater vulnerability about marginalized, among marginalized populations. So everything is interlinked. And the other fun thing is that we also have a greater recognition of the fact that the futures are emergent as are our capabilities to come together and create completely new adaptations to some of the challenges that we face. So some examples, distributed examples, and these are just a few. So let me take a slight break here. Um, on the mural board, since you can load actual papers and things on the mural board, um, I can, uh, I will upload uh, a collection I have of different futures platforms and foresight platforms that can be used to do some of this stuff. 
um, a document that inventories about um, a, a more than a dozen different ways to do visioning in communities. So there are a lot of resources out there and they're always being improved and they are currently being extended by a lot of these shifts into distributed decentralized and participatory efforts. So distributed scanning, um, there are platforms like Futures Radar and Factor. Decentralized and crowdsourcing, Futurescaper can be used to crowdsource emerging and weak signals of change and trends and crowdsourcing essentially futures wheels and impact cascades, what will happen to those trends. SenseMaker allows us, and, and there are a few other similar platforms, allows us to co collect actual narratives of what are some of the emerging issues of change? What are emerging narratives of change? What are images of change out there? So we could, in this day and age, literally go out to a city and say, we would like to collect the images of the future your baseline images the future that everyone in the city has. And then from the baseline perspectives, have start a conversation about, again, what entirely new things might emerge. Um, different participatory games. The Institute for the Future has a long history of supporting online participatory games. Nesta uh, supported uh, the Global Swarm in collecting a fantastic set of participatory exercises in organizations and communities and international networks on participatory approaches to envisioning futures. Um, there's been a lot of work in artifacts and museum exhibits that express provocative uh, potential futures that enable people to kind of visit the future in interesting ways. In supporting diversity, um, the Center for Post normal policy and future studies, which I'm affiliated with, has been working a lot on polylogs to um, to basically explore what uh, Zia Sardar has been calling mutually assured diversity and and conversations with respect for diversity of perspective, and the very strong efforts in decolonizing futures. Um, Pupu Bisht and uh, a, a whole team of people, whole group of people, are focusing on that. It's it's a, as I said, an incredibly welcome worldwide conversation that's being supported by a lot of people. Um, and the School of International Futures is one. Systemic approaches, um, Shift N does a lot of work in systemic foresight and uh, the OCAD strategic foresight training program includes teaching their graduate students um, to do, uh, to, to create gigamaps, which are systemic explorations of issues that then explore how different changes will affect the system of an issue and what that might mean for possible futures. Deep transitions is taking a very interesting approach in creating uh, scenarios of desirable futures by saying, here's the system that we currently have. And rather than talking about how that system will be transformed by exogenous changes is instead saying to get to desirable futures, what if we change the rules? following Danella Meadows um, sort of famous places to exert leverage on a system. What if we take the system as it currently is and, and institute an entirely different set of rules by which it functions? Where does that take us? Um, and again, we have all these emergent possibilities that in many ways were enhanced again by the pandemic situation of people learning to use online whiteboards like Mural and Miro. Um, the possibility of artificial intelligence and, and of all of us as, and by all of us, I literally mean the, the planet, hopefully at some point in the future, thinking about the future hand in hand with artificial intelligence in various ways and shaping tomorrow may be the very beginning of that in a lot of the work it's doing in AI scanning and analysis in future studies. But I really am excited about the fact that um, many of us were driven to do our workshops online using a combination of Teams or Zoom and Miro boards and creating amazing um, mindscapes of these critical conversations about change, about the future, um, about where we might all go. And you've seen that over the last year in a lot of the um, conferences and colloquia like this one. That have um, that have been able to share their mirror boards with everyone. So, this is really a moment of fantastic opportunity to expand the contribution of everyone 
in a city, in a village, in a community, in a region, to thinking about the future and thinking about it creatively, systemically, critically. So to end, but again, at every moment, we are faced with decisions. So as Farah Fakas said with regard to this moment of sort of the great pause, we are sitting on a saddle point, prepared to tip in either direction, and it is at the moment utterly indeterminate which of two directions we travel. So are we traveling into a future where we will be engaging with each other in Foresight 3.1, or are we not? And I'll stop there. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for all the uh, conceptual and methodological contributions to Foresight 3.0. This is uh, very much appreciated. Um, so now I'm moving to our uh, next speaker, Fabiana Scapola. Fabiana uh, will talk about future of governance policy lab experience. Uh, thank you, Ostran. Let me share my slides. Uh, one second, because I have an issue with it. Yeah, it's coming now, maybe. No. Uh, sorry, there is an issue with the slide. They feel like it's coming, so <laughs> almost here. Just in the gap, I would just mention, uh, I'm trying to write down what people are saying, either by slides or by interpretation of the key questions on the whiteboard. The link is uh, on here now. Um, and as we move towards the second interactive session, I'm encouraging people to to, to contribute on this whiteboard. And we can talk about how exactly that works in half an hour, but um, I look forward to that. Yeah. You can have a look already. Yeah, thanks Joe for taking notes actually, because they're very important messages I think coming from the speakers and we should definitely use this to, you know, improve the concept further to develop it. And then when we plan the next workshop, we can build on this experience so mm. that we can create this snowballing effect if you like. Um, so these are all very valuable. And you will use the whiteboards, our records, of course. For uh, I would like to, yeah, we're not only talking about foresight, but doing it. Oh, yeah, I can show your slides or someone else can show your slides. Uh, Fabiana, should I show your slides? And let me see if I manage. Yes, I, I have them here. <clears throat> it should be coming. No, it says there is a problem. I have a problem apparently with uh, sharing the slides. Uh, so okay. if you can share the slide for me, sure. that would okay. be very good. Uh, uh, and apologies for this. No, no problem. problem. Yeah. Just uh, coming so, up now. So it's actually a challenge to come as the last speaker because uh, I have to say that uh, um, uh, I can echo uh, everything that was said up to now. So my, my challenge is now to maybe uh, come and say something um, um, uh, interesting. So, so just to, to give an idea uh, to people that don't know me, I am uh, um, the head of the Competence Center of Foresight of the uh, European Commission, uh, but I also lead uh, um, the uh, EU Policy Lab uh, that is, uh, um, you know, a collaborative uh, uh, and experimental space uh, for innovative uh, policy making. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there is an echo, so maybe there yeah, are there's some, some echo. If everybody can mute, mute except Fabiana, then I think we will stop it happening. Yes, Fabiana. Yeah. Go and uh, uh, in this space, what we do, we explore and reframe issue. Um, uh, and uh, also we co-create a, a user center uh, solution. Uh, we try to think visually and systematically, engage diversity uh, of stakeholder, including citizen, and uh, um, you know, prototype, experiment, and test uh, a different way to do policy making uh, at uh, EU level, which uh, I have to say it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge. So, 
In this uh, few slides, what I also want to uh, do is to uh, show you where we are at European level in terms of uh, um, mainstreaming uh, strategic uh, foresight. Uh, next slide, uh, please, please. So uh, in, uh, in 2020, there was the first uh, um, commission uh, uh, publication of uh, the first uh, uh, strategic foresight report. And the, uh, that was making a call, especially due to COVID, uh, uh, on the need of anticipatory governance at all governance uh, uh, level from international up to local. And uh, as also Wendy was saying, you know, COVID-19 has really exposed uh, countries, regions, cities, citizens uh, to a number of uh, vulnerabilities and, uh, and disruptions. And uh, um, here we have an opportunity because strategic foresight now can have a key role uh, to play uh, to ensure that uh, policy are future proof and uh, also it can also help to ensure that policies uh, uh, that have a long-term perspective implied also a short-term initiative uh, that uh, can be started now. So in, in this report uh, uh, what we did we provided a systematic analysis of uh, the vulnerabilities and capacities that were revealed by the COVID crisis across uh, uh, four dimension of resilience uh, and uh, and we also have uh, looked at what are the opportunities and how strategic foresight can be fostered to identify this opportunity. And when, uh, next slide please, and when we look at uh, uh, particularly to cities, the vulnerabilities that uh, um, appeared and which will uh, not be new to, uh, to you uh, is that uh, of course COVID is uh, spreading much more quickly in urban dense and area and poor uh, neighborhoods. And over 70% of European population at the moment lives in cities. And of course, this number is expected to increase to 80% to 2050, which also will uh, create uh, pressure to city infrastructure. But uh, there are also capacities that cities have and urban areas have capacities that uh, uh, some of their uh, rural counterparts still lack. Uh, such as uh, being uh, close to health uh, facilities and, and digital infrastructures. And uh, uh, it is possible to strengthen uh, uh, an opportunity that is possible to strengthen resilience in uh, urban areas. Uh, next slide, please. So here, what we, we can, we have seen is that uh, strategic foresight uh, has a key role uh, uh, to explore future proof solution at uh, urban level. And by creating strong uh, partnership with citizens and local businesses uh, um, to, as key for uh, success. And uh, uh, participatory governance uh, and collective engagement uh, uh, need to be reinforced uh, towards what it is a more fair and sustainable uh, uh, future. And also uh, what strategic foresight can uh, help uh, uh, doing is to un unveil uh, an innovative solution in cities and strengthening uh, through forward-looking policies. And, and cities uh, also have uh, the key role in, in attaining uh, the ambitious policy targets outlined uh, in the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals and also in some of the European uh, uh, um, union policy initiative like uh, uh, Green Deal. But uh, um, what uh, cities uh, are also able to do is uh, they are, uh, I mean, they, they are really uh, can be test bed for uh, um, innovation and solution, uh, not only to city problems, but also um, uh, to then be amplified to larger scale and uh, and it is possible at city level to connect much uh, easily those directly uh, affected with uh, innovator, uh, investor and, and, and startup. If I move a bit more, uh, next slide, to, to what are the lessons learned? Uh, and I don't know if this re is really Foresight 3.0 um, to be more effective in, in relation to, to Foresight is that uh, um, it is important uh, that uh, foresight is systemic and uh, especially if this is done uh, uh, with some uh, uh, policy, uh, with some ambition to uh, 
you know, uh, engage in policy discussion and have some policy uh, recommendation. Uh, and this is very important because uh, all uh, the issues that we are facing at the moment, it's not only about COVID, it, they cut across uh, uh, boundaries and especially policy ones. So it is important to uh, get out policy side code. And, and uh, uh, um, uh, foresight needs to be participated. And, and uh, it's not only about involving stakeholders to collective intelligence, uh, uh, co to generate collective intelligence, but uh, um, we should use method and tools to engage uh, with stakeholders. And, and uh, in, in some cases, uh, this can still be um, a challenge because not everywhere uh, the culture of, of foresight has permeated uh, uh, across policymakers. And what it is also important to do is to highlight, and especially now after the COVID crisis, what are the costs of not doing foresight? So what are the costs of not engaging with the future? And uh, in terms of, uh, of methods, um, the experience that we are having is saying that, uh, um, you know, it is uh, uh, very important to be both qualitative, quantitative, and visual. So what we have done in one exercise, in one study that we, we carried out, we very much work with designer. Uh, and uh, uh, here, the, the call on uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, tools is also to uh, still uh, be able to be concrete uh, because uh, policymakers still uh, have this impression that uh, uh, data and numbers uh, are easy uh, to, they are more telling than uh, uh, narrative, uh, uh, but uh, in general we should use all the no knowledge sources that we have uh, available. and. Uh, um, I think it is also the role of uh, foresight to be bold and uh, so to uh, really push this cultural change in policy making and to engage uh, in discussion that uh, sometimes are not the discussion that policy makers uh, want to have, but uh, uh, discussing what are uh, the blind spots uh, and, uh, uh, and what uncertainty mean in terms of policy. And, uh, but, uh, in order to keep the engagement with them, I think it's very important to uh, be concrete and be very specific uh, on the action that can be started now in order just not to have foresight as a sort of a, uh, to be seen as a sort of a, a nice collective uh, uh, intelligent exercise, but which is nice to have, but not uh, where we need to act. And, uh, and uh, here, um, we have to be very specific on uh, uh, what are the innovation that uh, anticipatory thinking brings uh, to current uh, policies. And uh, I don't know, uh, Austin, can you tell me uh, if I have still a bit of time? Uh, um, I think, yeah, you can take another two, three minutes, Fabiana. Yeah, it was just to show, sure. next slide, uh, uh, please, that we did uh, uh, a study um, that was before COVID, uh, um, which was looking at uh, uh, how future government uh, uh, in 2030 and beyond uh, co could look like. And, uh, and here we have developed uh, uh, some uh, um, scenario, and, uh, uh, which I will not go into much uh, uh, detail about it because I can share also later uh, the, uh, the, the detail on the report, uh, but basically this was a study that uh, was really focusing on how governments uh, and the relation with citizen and business might look like in 2030 and beyond and, uh, and uh, uh, what can be uh, some uh, uh, policy uh, implication. And what was interesting about uh, uh, this uh, exercise was that uh, we did it in collaboration with uh, uh, different member states uh, uh, and policy labs across uh, member states. Uh, we were working in, in very close collaboration with uh, Austria, Malta, Ireland, Sweden, Spain, Poland, uh, and Belgium. And uh, um, so the, what was very interesting is that uh, uh, through this policy lab, we have worked directly with citizens. And what uh, was uh, uh, very interesting to see is that the insights that citizens bring are as much as relevant as uh, the insights that uh, experts bring. So this is a call of uh, uh, even uh, some of the foresight type of work to step out from uh, 
this more expert-based type of uh, work, even if uh, uh, coming from the Commission, I, I have to say that it is uh, uh, much easier uh, for us at Commission level uh, to, you know, claim that a foresight study was developed uh, through, uh, with a, a number of uh, very well-known scientists and, and experts uh, and business people than with citizens. And uh, um, what we did also, uh, next slide, and which could be interesting from a city perspective, and uh, we have worked a lot uh, with students of uh, design from six design school all across uh, um, Europe. Uh, um, uh, it was also UK, uh, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, uh, and um, uh, Poland. And uh, what we, we asked, uh, uh, what we did, we created prototypes and concepts uh, based on the scenario on how governments and public service will look like in, uh, in the future. And um, also, we have developed a, a, a game uh, uh, that uh, uh, can be used very much uh, at uh, city level or at local level, because uh, the, this game uh, uh, uses people's uh, anticipatory assumption about what uh, the future might look like uh, to generate uh, interesting conversation, negotiation, and also collaboration. And uh, we have tested this game in a number of occasions, and it proved to be very interesting. The game is also there, available uh, uh, for everyone that uh, wants to, to use it. In, uh, uh, it's online. And uh, it is also generating uh, uh, a participatory setting in which uh, debates ten, can take place. And uh, in, this, in this sense, it can be an interesting tool uh, uh, to be used at uh, local level to engage with citizens around very specific uh, local issues and to test the uh, potential uh, policy impact uh, of future uh, policies. So, and with this, uh, I uh, would like to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, Fabiana. That was a great presentation. Uh, again, uh, as you said, uh, there's a great consensus actually about the key principles of Foresight 3.0. And it is very interesting to hear that from different directions of the foresight world, whether it's from urban cities or from policy making perspectives or from the practitioner perspective, I think it's uh, it's great. So we can understand like our um, uh, key reference points for designing our future foresight theories and practice. So you weren't actually the last uh, speaker in this session. So we still have uh, Ian. Um, he has the hard job of bringing all this together and yeah. synthesizing all these messages and then extracting something interesting for us. So Ian, we have great expectations from you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can hear you yeah. and see you. That's good. I can see and hear us right now, but I'm going to try to uh, show a couple of PowerPoints uh, which I've put together. Um, so let us see if that is going to be possible. Um, heaven knows if it's possible. I'm going to try to find the right screen. Yeah, okay, let's see if that will work. Can you? Uh, I can't see anything showing as usual. Yeah. Um, from the share uh, tray, you may yeah. choose desktop and uh, yeah, and Ian, you could email them to me. You can show them. Yeah, just um, proves you should always email your slides before the session. Uh, yes, that is. It's particularly hard when your slides are meant to be produced during the session. Because... Exactly. Yeah, that was the challenge with Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not getting anywhere with this. So, well, let me, let me just talk. Um, and uh, uh, while yeah, I just keep, I will try to send Joe some slides, but uh, who knows what your slides. Hmm? Yeah, you can just uh, email them quickly and then we can see. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, so I will email them to, um, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to. Preferably to everyone. <laughs> Okay, okay, let me just talk through what I would be showing. Um, I can look at it myself to say 
Ian, uh, you can put them directly onto the whiteboard. You just go to the whiteboard, uh, select all your slides, uh, and just move them on. It's like magic. I, I was amazed when I first discovered. Yeah. Uh, so that is um, another option. It, it is amazing what happens uh, if your information technology systems all work properly, isn't it? Um, unfortunately, mine are not permitting me to do any of these sensible things, right? And, and that is just by having two computers and a phone running. Um, so uh, I look forward to this great future when we're going to be able to do all of these things seamlessly. I can see what it's going to be like. Um, I can see what it actually almost could be today, but it isn't for me. And I keep having this problem with online meetings. Um, which is a great shame because um, clearly online meetings are where we're at. OK, well, before this meeting, I prepared a slide um, or I started preparing a set of slides. And it was just about the question of four point, Foresight 3.0 and where we could locate it. And I was thinking, well, what we need to do is you know, look a bit about uh, you know, where Foresight has come from. Um, I'm not sure that I really uh except the idea that we've gone through these neat generations of foresight work so i, I tried uh, i had the idea well let me try to map out different foresight studies um and map them on in terms of a couple of dimensions um and one would be uh how far the studies focused on a very specific sharp problem or were very heavily reliant upon um dealing with one set of opportunities or issues for one organization, um, as opposed to uh, activities that try to be much more global uh, or encompass many, many different issues. In any case, if you're looking at a city, it wouldn't just be future employment in this city or future housing in the city and so on. Um, or if you're looking at uh, artificial intelligence, it wouldn't just be artificial intelligence's impact on employment or on governance or things like that. So that was one dimension. And the other dimension, was um, the extent to which the methods used and the range of sources of expertise involved uh, are, are relatively low, as opposed to approaches where you're using multiple methods, qualitative and quantitative, for example, um, uh, as uh, Fabiano was saying recently, um, uh, very wide participation um, or very limited participation, as a lot of people have been saying. And, so I came up with these two different dimensions of both of them are sort of relatively narrow approaches versus very wide approaches. Um, and I began trying to plot what is going on in the futures field and then the foresight field uh, from the 60s on in terms of this. And while it's a bit easy to plot some of the highlights of each of these decades, uh, the more I thought about it, the more it was obvious that there was activity of all sorts going on in most of these decades. Um, that's the first thing to say. So eventually I gave up my simple mapping activity. But what also what I could see was that the whole matrix, this whole space was becoming much, much more populated as we went on over time. So I think it was Wendy said that, you know, uh, we're at a, a period of great expansion of futures work. Uh, and a foresight work within that. Um, and that's clearly the case. We're, we're at a period right now where there are many groups pursuing many approaches, uh, often using different methods, often using a relatively small range of methods, but very rarely just using one method. Uh, sometimes you'll find that people will be doing a modeling study or a scenario workshop study or something like that. But much more often, we're seeing a, a lot of different methods being implied um, with varying levels of uh, participation of wider or narrower sets of stakeholders, um, dealing sometimes dealing with very specific issues, recovery from the pandemic, sometimes dealing with very much broader sets of issues. Um, so that is my first point, and that's something which I've heard echoed in a lot of the presentations today. Um, so I'm glad I was able to guess that in advance. Um, and the question that I'd like to pose for our thinking as we go on 
is when we're talking about for, foresight 3.0, um, are we talking about uh, an area in this sort of phrase, in this sort of framework? So an area, presumably, of wide studies using multiple approaches, using involving a lot of different stakeholders and participations, democratizing uh, foresight as far as possible, decolonizing foresight as far as possible, um, addressing a broad range of issues, not just narrowly focusing on the economic or the sociological and so on. Um, is that for is foresight 3.0 mainly a space within this world of all sorts of different futures approaches? Um, or is it also sort of a metaphor point, foresight 3.0? Um, in other words, uh, something that's trying to bring together and articulate and draw upon uh, many of these different activities. And um, maybe you know it's not an either or. Maybe a 4.3.0 has to be a meta foresight of some sort. Anyway, I I just leave that. That was my first uh, thought. And then I wanted to take up points um, surrounding where we're at right now. Um, and again, Wendy was saying we're very much at a um, potential turning point. Um, we could have a uh, uh, an effort to return to the old normal, uh, or we could have some completely new sort of approach. Um, and it seemed to me that the uh, pandemic it certainly presents all sorts of challenges and opportunities. Um, but one of the things that we need to uh, be aware of is that it's likely to result in a lot of diverse responses. I mean, we've already seen countries behaving in extremely different ways uh, during this pandemic. And the same is true at, at uh, lower levels of multi-level governance, cities and organizations of all sorts. Um, my expectation would be that we will continue to see a diversity of approaches um, and we will see big efforts to get back as far as possible on historic tracks and trajectories, and we will see big efforts to move in new ways. Um, and I had a, I captured this in terms of three A's really, that um, to some extent what we've seen in the pandemic is an acceleration of particular trends. Um, and we've talked about digitalization as one of these trends. It's not, not that all sorts of digitalization have been accelerated, certain sorts like online conferences and the problems they caused me and some other people. Um, we've seen the amplification of some issues, um, a bringing to awareness in particular um, of all sorts of social inequalities, power imbalances, privileges, privileges and lack of privileges that we have in our society. Um, and I don't think it's any um, coincidence at all that Black Lives Matter uh, has grown to be of such significance over the past year. And that's not going to go away. Um, the third thing um, uh, I, I, I use in another word beginning with A, which is agitate. Um, and that is that um, the crisis has problematized many existing trajectories. And many people have been questioning their existing ways of life because they've seen that there are aspects of new ways of life uh, that are very evident um, as a result of the crisis. It's been quieter. We've been able to hear the birds singing. We've been able to breathe fresher air, things of this sort. Um, so I would say that what we have seen and what we're witnessing right now is, is maybe we can think of it in two ways. There's um, impacts upon the sorts of things we could be looking at in foresight. Um, uh, uh, we've seen the, the, the large scale social change is possible. Um, uh, that you know, even national governments can introduce large changes which we would never have expected given their ideological predispositions. Um, and yes, there's been resistance to this sort of change, and it's very important to look at the sources and forms of resistance, but a, a lot has happened as a result of this crisis. So 
one issue for foresight, of course, is think about well, what could future crises do? What what sorts of because there are going to be future crises. There are going to be all sorts of things happening in the future. What sorts of things um, are allowed to provoke? What sorts of change uh, into the future? Um, what how long lived is this change going to be? I think Mark Tudor Jones was introducing this point. Are we seeing a blip, or are we seeing uh, something that is going to be much more ingrained and embedded? Um, and Again, I would say what we're likely to see is a mixture of all sorts of responses where efforts to return to normal, efforts to create slight reformist shifts to the normal situation, efforts to create all sorts of tra major transformations um, in, in how societies operate. I would anticipate we will see multiple outcomes in multiple geographical spaces, in different cities, in different countries, in different areas of life. Uh, and among different communities. A um, lot of opportunity for experimentation and learning, of course. Um, uh, a lot of opportunity for harmony, a lot of opportunity for discourse, discord. Um, and then the second big thing is that the, the, reign, the role of foresight will change. And Mark introduced this um, as a starting point, uh, the, the question of what is legitimacy, the undermining um, of expertise um, in a lot of... Um, populist discourse, um, but also, you know, there's a sensible critique of expertise as well. We've seen much failure of expertise uh, in the pandemic um, and uh, much misunderstanding of the nature of expertise and the role of expertise and the nature of science itself. Um, and, well, this is a topic for foresight work, but it's also something that very much influences how we may be able to conduct foresight work, with what sorts of legitimacy, um, uh, with what sorts of communication with different st stakeholders and things like that. Um, and we have certainly learned that we need to upgrade our communications. We need to do better um, because we've had pandemics on our risk radar and we've had pandemics featured usually marginally in many foresight exercises, uh, I can only think of one where, um, which was a mainstream foresight study where pandemics um, featured to a major degree um, uh, and uh, uh, the nature of um, infectious diseases was, was very much highlighted. Um, normally it gets mentioned as just one of the things that might happen and where we need to be paying some attention, but there's another 13 things we also need to be looking at. Um, and uh, yes, but, I think, is the, the, the conclusion as a result of this. Um, Foresight more generally needs to reflect on um, how, we are, how we relate to other areas of futures-oriented activity, like risk analysis, like emergency planning, um, like resilience processes, um, the governance, the thinking about the very governance structures we have in play these sorts of things um, and, to, and to wrap up I think you know the, uh, a few lessons that you know we need to learn from this crisis as well as just general humility um, uh, is that um, well things can catch us to even things we think of quite a lot in foresight are liable to catch us um, unawares because typically it, we don't see enough aspects of the big changes that may happen. Um, and most sort of so-called wild cards are not just wild cards, they're whole packs of cards. All, all sorts of developments are likely to pop up surprisingly as a result of one or other uh, major development that we have thought of, but we've thought of in limited ways. Um, and distant early warnings are, are largely ignored. One lesson we have though is that you know, in this pandemic, some countries have performed particularly well. Uh, most of those are countries um, where they've had more recent experience of dealing with similar crises. Um, and there must be um, some lessons in this for us about rehearsals, uh, about setting up of networks uh, and the like. Another lesson is that 
there have been rapid responses, many fantastic rapid responses, often in a bottom-up manner. And several people mentioned the need for social innovation, the need for a bottom-up initiative. Geki was saying this, for example. Um, uh, often at a city level or to, uh, even areas within cities, the uh, explosion of community groups using WhatsApp uh, and the like to help um, deal with the pandemic at a local level is really, really refreshing. And we also see you know, at an international level, scientists, for example, getting together, um, establishing new networks and communities, which have actually turned out to be vital in sharing um, critical information about, for example, the nature of the virus uh, and the nature of response. Sometimes this information has been suppressed um, by uh, national governments and even by respected international organizations. Um, you may have uh, seen a news item just yesterday on the WHO's um, uh, non-communication of evidence about the Italian pandemic, for example, uh, in a timely fashion for other countries to learn from. Um, but the bottom-up um, strategies for uh, improving communications within communities at a local level, at an international level, at all levels, uh, proved to be really, really important here. Yes, but, of course, misinformation spreads as well. Um, and not all, not all rapid responses are positive responses. Um, and uh, we see, for example, in this country, there's been many experiences of uh, businesses, for example, acting in a very altruistic way. Um, uh, uh, beer companies producing alcohol, for example, for sanitizers, um, all sorts of activities of that sort. We've also seen more unscrupulous people moving in to make huge amounts of money profiteering on the um, sourcing and sale of um, uh, protective equipment and the like. Um, uh, and networks to expose that sort of activity are also proving to be very important. Okay, uh, I better be winding up. <laughs> I think. Um, there are many other lessons that could be drawn, um, but I think I would come back to um, the need for uh, us to think in the case of for Foresight 3.0, how we're going to be able to link our activities in this area um, with all sorts of other activities that are going on. And obviously top of the list right now is uh, emergency risk uh, and resilience um, uh, management activities of various sorts. How they, these already exist. So how can these be um, turbocharged uh, and much better informed by wider foresight work? Okay, okay. thanks very much. Well, thank you, Ian. So that was the... <laughs> Like a great intervention. I mean, very, you know, thought provoking ideas, and Joe's captured some of them. Yeah, thank and, you, Joe. Yeah, so and so he is now directing us to the uh, foresight space, the um, co working area. Uh, but before uh, probably uh, going into that, shall we give a, a short break, like for people to breathe and take? They are at least eyes from the screen for a few sure. minutes. Uh, and I think then... uh, some people have to leave. So uh, a big thanks to people who have to leave, uh, who contributed, etc. Um, on the program, we said we would uh, have some coffee in the virtual 3D space. Um, and you're very welcome to you know, a five minute break or something. Uh, and then so let's say yeah, at uh, quarter past um, 15 sorry, 1750 mm -hmm. Moscow time. Uh, I will then explain the process for the next steps. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, as many as possible people can uh, be part of this very interesting process, uh, which will focus on the whiteboard. So, and here you see, you know, work in progress on the whiteboard. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So uh, there have been some uh, uh, comments uh, on the uh, chat board. Um, so, well, maybe some questions too. Uh, let's use this co-working space that you to interact with each other, and maybe you may find the people that you want to talk to directly from the uh, application. 
So. Uh, okay, well, uh, maybe I'll just mention now, uh, so you can think about it <laughs> uh, over coffee. Uh, I think the most useful way to proceed is to say, okay, I have some really practical questions. Uh, how do we do this thing? You know, it's fine when we have these meetings and, oh, yes, very strategic and participative, etc. Uh, but I walk out the door, it's a hostile environment uh, for the most part. Uh, and beyond, you know, the, the narrow uh, rooms of, you know, foresight and futures thinking and so on. So these are the six questions most coming from the discussion so far. Uh, I have my own ideas. Well, uh, the case study, which I mentioned, is then mapped out over here. But I think first, there's an intermediate stage. Uh, and if I could ask your advice uh, to uh, for, for your best ideas, how to answer these questions, uh, particularly the most practical. We've had a lot of theory, so let's get to the practical. Um, and anyway, so uh, let's come back to that in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Could I ask a question? Sorry. Could uh, I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, sure, Wendy. Please go. Very ahead. quick. Um, so when we come back in five minutes, we'll have Teams open so we can talk and also be using Mural. Yeah. But in the meantime, we are exploring the 3D what's it. If you have if you want to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you have two, and, and three computers or screens. <laughs> yes, exactly. How many screens <laughs> yeah. you have? Um, yeah. which are the most useful tools for what? Uh, well, the, the Teams is good for talking. The no, no, sorry. Sorry, I'm actually looking at your mural board. You have key themes and pilots, which oh. are the most useful tools. Yeah. So if we list a tool, should we also say, and this is what it's useful for? Because different tools are useful for different things. I should say here, actually, for city and region or work. Yeah, uh, because the theme of this session is particularly cities and regions. Okay. Right. But. OK, uh, but there's a lot you could do. I mean, there are a lot of different issues, questions, things that you could do in just a city regional project. But that's OK. okay. We'll all sure. that's okay. We'll, we'll work it out on the board. OK, great. Thanks. Yeah. Let's play your card with the board. So. <laughs> play your card. <laughs> See you in a moment. Okay. See you in a moment, yeah. Is that Joe? Yes, hi, Ian. Hi, hi. Joe. We can hear you very loudly shutting a door and sighing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we heard you loudly shutting a door and sighing. Um, I'm just going to go and get myself a drink. Sure, yeah. I'm sorry about the mess with my presentation. Oh, no worries. It happens, yeah. But um, uh, it, it, it happens every time for me. 
Well, if you can send them in advance, then you know it makes everything smoother and easier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyhow, we, we are, it was fine. Uh, Joe? Hi. Oh, Gashi, hi, hi. How hey. are you? Good. Do you need us to stay on for this next bit? Well, uh, if you can, it, it will be very useful to you and everything you do. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, yes. I appreciate like you're super busy, you know. <laughs> yes, I'd like to, only that I'll, I'll have to be screen off because I have to kind of multitask, but sure. I would like to participate if that's okay, and I'll maybe yeah. comment on the board as we go along if that's okay. That would be great, yeah, fantastic. Sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you for Gechi, this. and do we have your slides? They were, they uh, were fantastic. Oh. It was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Ah, yes, no, sure. Happy to send those. I, I didn't actually. I'll, I'll send them right away. Yeah, oh, well, I can distribute. They, they will be um, all the slides from the whole conference uh, will be available after. Um, Fantastic. But if you want to have a look, they're actually on the mural right now. Oh, yes, I thought, I saw Joe had put them on uh, there. Uh, so this is the, the new technique. I'm, I'm very enthused you know, with this <laughs> way of working. Uh, you put the slides up and then you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, oh, here you are. Actually, I missed a couple because I was just grabbing them off the screen. Um, well, and I, what I may do is update mine because I actually can add in some uh, sure. specific links to things. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just send them through. Or, well, as I now discover from a PowerPoint, you just, you know, copy the um, the, the whole set, dump them on the screen on, on the mural. What could be more simple and amazing? But then I tell you what. Uh, and you might have good ideas. Um, in this process, well, we end up with whole bunches of slides. Uh, and in my in, in my thinking, oh yeah, this is non-linear thinking. You know, this is what we need to solve non-linear problems. But everybody is used to, and they've grown up with linear kind of you know discourse like here's the experts we will look at their slides and ask a couple of questions and then the next expert uh, and and so on that's a linear kind of thing so how do we in enable people to practice non-linear thinking you know like um, two or three dimensional um so well you know i best advice is needed really um yeah, so, so this was partly the, the idea of setting up this 3D thing uh, just to see what might happen. And then, you know, we put up the results from the workshop onto the 3D. Yeah, the 3D thing is a little fussy in terms of flying and moving around. I mean, they're kind of mm. fun, but but I must say, and, and I don't use Miro, I use Miro, M-I-R-O, because actually mm. I prefer its capabilities and interface, but... Mm. Having to switch to a combination of Zoom and Miro starting in what March of last year mm. has transformed not just interactions with you know the communities and various people I deal with and organizations, but teaching has gotten I mean, because I was teaching online anyway at mm. Houston, right? Teaching has gotten fantastic. I have Mm. Can I share my screen a second? Sure. Let me show you. So I, I am so proud of my graduate students. They are amazing. Um, hold on. Uh, this is, so we have the largest foresight graduate class we have ever had in the history of the University of Houston's program. Yeah. It was, it, we normally have like 12 to 15 people we had 50, five zero. Mm. So I built a Miro board where we had interactive exercises for every single class session. Mm. Wow. Um, and the cool thing about it is that each one of these, I can save this to PDF and each one of these squares or frames is a right. page in a PDF. So yeah. they have the entire, um, they have the entire semesters interactive work mm. available to them yeah. uh, sure, like know, that. <laughs> to review. It is just, it was so fantastic. And yeah. I have all these amazing examples of things to be able to show people and share with people. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's so great because you can download, as you point out, you can download um, 
pictures, other things. So we just, oh my God, we had so much fun. And my systems class, same thing this semester. Yeah, yeah. My systems class is having an amazing time. And as you say, you can put whole slides on. Mm -hmm. You can also put entire resources. So um, when I'm having workshops, I put whole PDFs. Have I done that on this one? No. Um, but you can put whole PDFs on and just people can download a PDF straight from the sure. board. It's just, yeah. seriously. I'm having more fun being stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yeah. But, uh, but, but yeah. you do miss some of the sensory uh, aspects of obviously being in a, a live room with live other people. But. Oh, totally. Uh, and well, we find, yeah, there's, the students, they're like a captive audience. So you can say, oh, yeah, let's do this for an hour and a half. And they usually will do it. If you try and say that to, you know, busy people coming and going, then it's uh, you really have to work hard, you know, to catch them. Um, anyway, um, but um, have you two met, by the way, uh, Geshe? Yes. Yeah. yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in Morocco, I think it was that we first oh, met. Yeah. Yes, Robot. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think we've met at least twice, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. 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 So good being here again together. So, um, so just uh, well, I think that, that we should be starting again. I'm not sure if our host and chair is in the <laughs> just. Uh, I, I, I'm going to, and I'm going to briefly turn off and go away because I got sidetracked talking. I'll be right back. Sure. Yeah. Here we go. <clears throat> so, well, Joe, we are all in your hands now. Okay. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> So, well, uh, let me uh, basically work from the screen. Uh, you, of course, uh, everybody here is very welcome to access the screen through their own link, which means that then they can put stuff on. And what we are trying to do now is to reflect on the last uh, hour and a half and take on board the messages and then say, OK, what do they mean and how do we move this forward? Because, you know, we've been in many meetings where, you know, ideas go around and around and then the meeting is finished and you have some coffee uh, and then you go away. So, well, for me, you know, the situation is now urgent. The possibilities are huge. I think we can do more. Um, so just to demonstrate what is on the screen so far. Well, my presentation is up in the corner. Uh, and as you know, the great thing with these online things is you can you know, zoom in, zoom out, make things small or large, and they're still there. And that's a fantastic thing. Um, Mark's presentation, uh, I took notes, and I think he's left now uh, because he's doing a tender proposal. Uh, that's the front page of his best project. Um, and I very much respect what he does because he is not only you know, a leading academic, but also a man of practice and doing stuff. Um, so that is something I take very seriously. Geshe's uh, slides are here, and I find them incredibly, you know, imaginative, provocative, uh, and I just want to kind of <laughs> dive in. Uh, but questions come up all over the place. And, well, coming from South Africa, which as I know is, you know, uh, huge challenges, huge opportunities. Um, and some of these challenges are very, very structural. Um, so, and then Wendy's contribution, as you see here, is uh, actually very practical, but also visionary. Uh, and she has, a, you know, a, an incredibly useful list of tools and techniques and, and so on, some of which I've, couple of, I, I've worked with. Uh, and again, I would like to know more. But, um, and then, um, what else? Um, oh, yeah. Yuna Lee, if she's still here. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, she was very keen. So she supplied a whole set of notes before and um, about the response to the pandemic and what this means in terms of foresight, etc. cetera. Um, and Ian has contributed, uh, well, again, uh, just taking brief notes here. Uh, some of these themes advanced could be, you know, queried and elaborated, obviously. And I think that our Fabiana's uh, contribution is here. And I particularly uh, liked the last little 
bit of the, you know, scenarios for governance, governance 2030, and ways to do it in practical terms. So at this point, I'm looking as far as possible for your best ideas are on comments and responses to uh, these very urgent and practical questions. And let's just make sure that uh, in all of these, uh, the um, focus is uh, in cities and regions. Not to say that nothing else is important, but that's just what we are trying to focus on today. <laughs> okay, uh, other sessions will have a different focus. Uh, the next one coming up um, after the summer will be on artificial intelligence or collective human artificial intelligence, you know, which could involve cities and regions, but also involves a whole lot of other stuff. Um, so um, now at this point, some people would break into groups. I think we are not uh, so many in numbers uh, and there isn't so much time. So I would have not propose to break into groups. In fact, I don't have the technology to do that from here. Um, but I think a discussion, which is partly in verbal terms here on the Teams platform, and then which where people as far as possible are encouraged to provide uh, responses to these questions. And again, the focus being on foresight in cities and regions. Where that goes after that, and I'll just mention, we have a template. Uh, and this template comes, well, it's published in the big book, uh, which if anyone didn't already spot it, it looks like this, Deeper City, Collective Intelligence. Uh, and this, the book is based on a methodology for mapping collective intelligence. The methodology has a set of templates. This is the kind of expanded template, depending on where we go in either in this session or the follow up, we can use, you know, the whole template or just pieces of it and so on. Um, and just to explain the template for which you're also invited to contribute, it's very simple. We map the actors involved around the table, the stakeholders. We map their value systems. Is it economic? Is it political? Is it social or environmental? Uh, and we map how things work either the foresight process or the you know urban planning process, which foresight is trying to uh, help maybe, and so on. And you can see here, these comments come from uh, my previous notes on gaps and barriers. And in the template, so, okay, we'll put all the gaps and barriers and problems on one side. And then on the other side, when we get to it, we'll put all the solutions and pathways and opportunities with the same mapping. So probably this will take place in the follow up later on. But first, uh, I think the important thing to do is to just provide answers or uh, responses to these questions. Uh, so if you have any expertise, any experience, any ideas, please put them on the, the screen now. Uh, it's very easy. You just double click. There's a post it note and you place it where you want to. In, in terms of these six questions. If there are more questions that you would like to address, please say so now, or just write them on the board. Um, you can copy and paste any one of these just by, you know, um, control C and control V, it's very easy. Uh, so uh, I'll leave that also with you. Any comments and questions? Hello, anyone here? Hi, I'm just busy typing. Great. Right? <laughs> I think That's fine. I think we mostly all are doing that, right? Great. Right. Uh, and, and, and while you type and think, um, I'll, maybe I'll just say a couple of words if, if that's allowed. 
Why is this so important to me? Well, years ago, uh, I was a community planner and architect working in very difficult places all around the north of England. Uh, and I began to get the idea, OK, we can do this project and this scheme and improve this land or rescue this you know, old building or something, uh, which is you know, a, a good thing to do. It needs a lot of skill. But I began to see that there was much more structural things that needed to be addressed. So for myself, I came into the foresight world almost by accident, uh, just because it seemed like a necessary and urgent thing to do. Um, so, and then I realized, okay, yeah, with the, the new word which came up, sustainability, this was, you know, the global thing, but it needed new ways of working, new ways of uh, exploring the future and linking that back to the present and, and so on. So again, we, uh, well, at some point I met uh, Ian Miles and then Austrian Sanitas and then I think uh, Wendy and uh, became a member of the SAMI uh, consulting group and, and so on. Um, so went through a long period of trying to improve these methods because it seemed, yeah, we had great methods, but often they were not used in everyday life out there, you know, in the big city that I'm in right now. Uh, and even now, I have a reputation, but if I go to, you know, the mayor or the director of economic development or something like this, and I say, yeah, let's run a foresight exercise. And he or she will often say, well, that's nice, but actually we're really busy, thank you. So try again another time, <laughs> you know. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, they make most terrible mistakes. Um, at the moment, they have a plan, well, I say they, we have a plan for uh, zero carbon, Greater Manchester, in just 17 years from now, they want to do transition big time. Uh, and I'm saying, sorry, I don't think this is working. I, I don't see it when I look out of the window. And they say, well, yeah, but we, yeah, we have a big program and a big publicity and see our website, it looks great. Uh, and I say, well, how about some foresight techniques? You know, it could really help. And by the way, I've you know developed this theory of inter you know, collective intelligence. And they say, oh, no, that academic stuff. Sorry, we haven't got time for that. And so now I'm simplifying, <laughs> but this is often my you know, lived experience. So if you have any uh, comments and ideas for how this can work, great. You know, let us know. Um, so there's a lot of activity on tools for city and regional work. That's great. Um, and uh, urban planning seems not so popular just at the moment. That's fine. I'll just tidy up this thing a bit. Um, it's uh, fine to keep on talking, by the way. Um, we can all multitask these days. Um, can maybe we? <laughs> uh, so I'll put on some ideas I have on urban planning. <clears throat> Um, and also, uh, well, I will just mention one foresight exercise we had, uh, again, local, uh, which was looking at low traffic neighbourhoods in somewhere not far from here. Uh, and then, you know, we had some result, and then the city council said, OK, yes, we'll have a policy and we'll have a little bit of money, not much, but enough to get started. Uh, so they uh, put together, you know, a pr proposal and then, you know, a pilot experiment on low traffic neighbourhood, meaning, you know, you put barriers in the road to stop cars just running through, uh, reclaim the space for humans, not so much cars, and so on and so on. And then it turned into a kind of culture war between the local people who wanted all this stuff and they were happy about the barriers, 
and other local people who are not happy about this stuff and they say, no, the barriers are in the wrong place, it will be a problem. And, uh, you know, uh, if you make the straight streets safe for people, all the drunken people, the alcoholics, they will come and make trouble. Uh, so it was a really big culture war. So this was one experience of how not to do foresight in the local level in urban planning. Um, Wendy, have you any advice about that? What did we do wrong? Uh, sorry, could you back up a second? I was looking for something. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> what did we do in in engaging in foresight at the local level? Sorry. We, we, we started this, well, we, we did a small local project, which then led into a city council uh, plan for low traffic neighborhood. And this then became uh, a culture war. Uh, some of the residents wanted this, other residents wanted that. And it, it was very difficult to find any agreement. This is just you know, a small local. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so a couple, because immediately where you say we have the residents and city council. so. You were building bottom up, so yay, the residents feeling empowered. But of course, by doing that, you were challenging the, the sense of power in the city council by people who presumably ran for election for city council. So did so for the reason that they like having decision making power. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with power differentials and 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 just within the, the region. One of the things, sorry, I'm going to back up a second. One of the things that people underestimate a lot is the amount of time that's needed to clarify and and help people have an empathic understanding of the differences of perspective that everyone is bringing to the table mm -hmm. and then to negotiate trade-offs mm -hmm. and a lot of times people think like they'll be able to do a visioning process in Yes, I have a, there's a three day workshop process we're using for visioning without really getting the fact that if you're, if you're having conversations with multiple disparate kind of communities within the community or tribes within the community, however you want to put that, that there is actually a fairly long conversation that needs to be had both about what they're all bringing to the table in terms of their assumptions and making those assumptions explicit and also in in choosing paths into the future or choosing even properties to guide emergent unfolding of the future of aspirational futures you have to negotiate the trade-offs and that takes a really a long mm. time mm. Mm. and i think i think we don't and, and i say this as someone who as i said collects tools like shiny things mm. um that we we often and i think this is what getchy was referring to when she was talking about the sort of the tyranny of the tool right mm -hmm. we get so engaged in well this is a cool process we can take people through that we forget to factor in you know the process is operating at this speed the thinking and the understanding and the empathy and um the reconciliation and everything else is happening at very different speeds Mm -hmm. And and I'm I'm wondering if that may have been, I mean, you know, and especially when when we're talking either as academics or as people who are yeah. bidding for projects, and you have a timeline, right? Yeah. You have to get this project done by X date and write the report. Uh, okay, my community is still struggling with their conversation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So if you have, uh, we've all done scenario work. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, can you have your conversation for a second. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I've been listening on and off. I was in uh, one of the speaker of the session before. Mm, I saw it. Um, sharing some experiment about uh, how art project and art spaces could be places to design urban futures. Mm. Um, so I don't know if you followed the panel before, and uh, and I was actually interested in asking you the question. In among all the the cases that you have done on uh, the future of cities, have you experimented there? Uh, Methods with their, um, art places and or cultural institutions with audience that are, you know, more in the cultural field. Mm -hmm. Have you done any project? I mean, 
because I think it's a, it's a quite underestimated potential mm -hmm. because uh, creative people, it's their job to be creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you embark them on a, on a future journey, whatever the, the method you use, they take it personally and they, mm -hmm. they, it becomes part of their life. It's not that just, you know, it's not an excursion. It's something mm -hmm. that they can work with after mm -hmm. in a cultural production, in a project. And so it's a way of incubating already some kind of micro futures by working with creatives. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to advocate for, generally speaking, such as in the session before. And I'm, I was quite curious to hear if it's something you have in mind in your, you know, when you, because um, it's one of the stakeholders that are not, not often are included. I know uh, Gessie has done projects in Africa and I'm totally aware of, your, of the, uh, the festival you worked on and uh, but otherwise it's quite rare. Mm. Can I comment on it? Yes, please go. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, so absolutely. We have in our context been experimenting with working with creatives, and then you might also be familiar with the whole space of Afrofuturism, which yeah. itself is very much driven by creatives. Uh, if anything, I think what I've been trying to do recently in my work is bring this idea of visualization, representation, the arts in general. Uh, 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 into a conversation about the future in a way that also doesn't separate the two, because I think where we've gone, at least in the space of Afrofuturism, is where it's almost become a parallel form of futuring from then the other normal stuff, which doesn't change, in fact, and doesn't incorporate uh, those approaches or even those people uh, into, into what it does. So I think maybe that would be my one comment. I have recently been acquainted with a person, Vaya Karaiskau, I don't know, you might know her, she's from Open University of Cyprus. I'll put her name. Uh, I think she is um, part of the Global Futures Literacy Network uh, at UNESCO, but she's based at Cyprus, and she's specifically been using the arts and deconstruction from the arts into thinking about the future. So again, these ideas about visualization and the role of, uh, of the arts in the future in a much more academic way than we've been doing. I've been doing it maybe uh, in the space of practice. She's doing some deep sort of theoretical work into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or if you're interested in it, because the, 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 the project I, I worked on for about 10 years about the future of the greater Paris, I'm based in Paris, huh? uh, I can put the web, the website is a bit old now, but at least it will give you, maybe that can be interesting for you to, because I made quite a few experiments with art school, design school, um, creatives uh, of all kinds, let's see, the, Net. And, uh, um, uh, and I've published quite a few articles also related to it uh, for near future designing project, designing uh, uh, prototypes, designing future futurescaping. When mm -hmm. I did that, I was I was not aware of the concept of futurescape, but uh, that's what I you know retroactively that's what uh, we did uh, for short term, long term horizon like. Uh, we, um, you know, one one step was to work on a future vision at a horizon of 150 years, for instance. But some others were very much based on uh, searching for weak signal for uh, to empower the creative community. So very diverse uh, steps. Mm. And um, I'm available if you want to talk further about it, or maybe Oscar will distribute the slides if that's interesting uh. for you. Yeah. It's a project that is finished now for me, huh? but it, 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 I realize that it has been uh, like a, it's many steps of research that were not inscribed in the foresight community because it's with that project that I joined the foresight community. And uh, so it started more as an art project and then an art based research project, urban research project, and it became a foresight research project. So it's more like coming from the outside. Mm -hmm. And so, I ask, uh, I, the, 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 your projects look fantastic. I, I would love to explore and know more. In, uh, and as you can see, I, uh, I think, you know, in creative uh, visual thinking and so on, I, I draw every day and, and so on. But I still find there is this big gap 
you know, between, oh, here is the policy people and, you know, planners and sooner or later there'll be a road with concrete and steel and there will be a, you know, a new urban development. And they say, oh, yes, yes, you can do your creative stuff and we will even give you an exhibition room. And it's all very nice and everyone goes and has some wine or something and then they go back to their day job. <laughs> and it's very difficult really to link, to build the connection between. Do you have any... Uh, uh, advice for that? Well, I mean, th uh, I'm, I'm totally aware of what you're saying. Uh, and, and to be honest, with the project, we uh, so Paris Galaxy, uh, it started as an art project and then it, it entered the art research department of Sorbonne University. Mm -hmm. And then I had like all kind of a partnership with the design school, the design management, art management masters, graphic design, uh, you know, a whole web of a collaboration. But it mm -hmm. I was invited a few times in the, the official um, uh, platforms that were discussing the Greta Paris, but I, it remained very marginal. Mm. Uh, it's more, uh, strangely, it's more abroad that I got much more um, interest at the Urban Lab at UCL, uh, at Antwerp University. Uh, and it's actually a project that I'm invited to present in many contexts at uh, Futurible International in Paris at the Foresight Institute, mm -hmm. um, uh, at the UNESCO uh, uh, ongoing uh, Transforming Future Seminar. Uh, so it's also because I started the project, in, it was really in a corner, like I started it as an artist, but my background was in economics and finance. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, I was interested in modelizing the future of the city by having a multi multidisciplinary approach. Mm. Uh, I gave it a very, uh, I, I took a very clear focus on, on, on art, but in the model that I designed, um, I included our economic dimension, educational dimension, urban planning. And so the conceptual matrix that I designed was uh, also a pedagogic, tool, a, pa a pedagogic tool that I used in many contexts that were very good at showing why you need to, to think at different levels and different perspectives so that artists knew where they were, but also people who were in other disciplines knew where they were in that matrix. Mm -hmm. And so it has remained, you know, I, I, I design it uh, uh, um, uh, quite intuitively with the first scenario I designed, like, uh, you know, in 2008. Mm. So that's already a while ago. And uh, but it ended up being a very useful pedagogical tool. I, um, if you I think I think Oscar is going to share my slide. Um, uh, or we can uh, let me put my email in the chat. <laughs> and send you some material and, and it's on the on the, the website is a bit old now, but um, do you want to share your slide right now? Maybe Just... <coughs> put it on the board also. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Put it on the board. Yes. Why not? Yes. If it's relevant. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I guess uh, in in five minutes or something we should have just a uh, plenary wrap up discussion. Yeah, no, but I, and I, we'll have a quick look at the notes, the post-it notes which have gone up on the board and what they mean, and and have a little chat. Yeah, that would be probably a good thing in in about five minutes. Yeah. Uh, in about five minutes, so that we can finish at uh, six o'clock. We, we should finish on on time. That, uh, we, we can always have you know virtual coffee <laughs> anytime. Uh, well, uh, I'll check with the colleagues actually. So there are a lot of people now helping to run the system. So uh, and there there might be some translators also like still working on this. So let's have an official um, ending of the session. Sure. And, and uh, after that, I can see if the, you know, the teams can stay open still, and then some conversation will continue with anybody who wishes. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Raphael, did you want to put something on the board? Yeah, uh, I'm trying to. Where should I put it? Because I would not. Because my slide, you know what? I think at the end of my presentation there is quite a few slides that are that do not relate. So I'd rather I, I would need to go to uh, to clean a little bit my file before I import it. Uh, so, sure. Or just select one or two. Um, if. Um, uh, yeah. Should the board manager will come along after and tidy. You know, put everything in in a tidy place. Uh, uh, 
Uh, future SCAPO with the UK government and um, that maybe started to bridge some of the gap between the stories that people think you know most people think in stories and and, and people and so on uh, and then other people think in technique and you know data and numbers and and so on and it seemed the future SCAPO online system maybe could bridge that gap uh, I think in practice it seemed quite problematic, you know, for a number of practical reasons. Um, but uh, I wondered, I mean, that is on your list of useful tools. Can we use we this? We were using it, we were using it um, very specifically to do scanning. Hmm. And it was actually designed, I mean, and it works as a scanning database. Um, it, it was actually designed to be a crowdsourcer. Hmm. Um, so um, it it actually works. Um, it, it's it's in a sense it's easier to use as a crowdsourcer, and it produces mm. more interesting results in many ways because you're getting other people's. I mean, mm. you're getting the actual community's idea about what changes they're seeing and what impacts they think they will have on their community. Mm. Whereas we were using it kind of as a way to create. As, as a scanning database. Mm. So now, yeah. let's see. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so you can put whole docs on the mural board, which is what I just did with my vision inventory, visioning process, processes compendium. And we'll see if it opens. I guess it opens and downloads. See, on, on Miro, you could just, oh, wait, is that a doc file? Yes, hold on. On Miro, you could just, um, like, load a PDF, and you could actually read it on Miro, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, I think you can load it, but you, you have to then download it uh, on this one. I think Miro is slightly better than Mural. I just kind of got started with Mural and paid the money. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh. It's, they 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 get us uh, caught in, in in so many interesting ways. Yeah, well, it's all new stuff. I mean, they're all learning. Uh, but I wish Mural had some of the added functionalities of Miro. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, Um, <clears throat> so, um, also, uh, you'll notice one or two uh, red circles, um, and uh, these are like critical comments, questions. You say, oh, the theory is nice, but actually the practice doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, in my critical mind, I'd say, well, sorry, we tried regional development with Foresight, and it was okay, but then, you know, the policy process did something different uh, and so on. Why is this? Can it be done better? So maybe at this moment, Oschan, should we um, <clears throat> uh, call the, the plenary back in, so if they're not already here, <laughs> uh, and aim to finish on time? <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to you know, continue to chat, that's, that's fine with me. I'm around for another half an hour. Yes, that's, that sounds like a good idea. Okay. Well, everybody's here, I guess. Yeah. So, um, the, the, probably the best way to do this is is not to look for long speeches of summing up and so on now, but maybe just to review, if I may, the uh, comments which have come up, uh, and um, <clears throat> so or questions. And I asked a question about tools, uh, and here I see oh three horizons shared history. This looks very good. Uh, and um, that's a useful thing. And then the generations chain, excellent. Uh, Futurescaper, and here it is, the Futurescaper we were just talking about. 
which is a way of, how would you say, telling stories uh, in a structured way, which then can be analyzed and, you know, sorted in terms of data management. Um, next, Hamburg. Well, we, yes, we've tried this also. Um, and so on. So, um, interesting list. There's a big W. Um, and uh, Futures Literacy Labs. And I'll just mention, okay, so I have this project uh, just about a couple of kilometers from here in an inner city neighborhood, rough, tough place. It's full of drug dealers and uh, illegal people and um, uh, social problems of all kinds. And we tried a futures project five years ago. Uh, and what did we find? Oh, the usual people come to our meetings, but not the drug dealers and not the people with really big problems. <laughs> so, yeah. Next time we want to open the door, say, oh, drug dealers, welcome. <laughs> Come in, you know, uh, we will not, uh, you know, take your photograph uh, and, and so on and so on. So, uh, well, we have a lot to learn. Um, there's a, some good comments on urban planning. Does anyone want to tell us what their idea was more than there's already on the board at this moment? Um, please feel free to speak. If you don't, then we will never know. Um, could I could I make a comment on the fact that I've I've been championing crowdsourcers and they are useful, but can I now talk a little bit about downsides? Yeah. Just like with survey research, you have to work really hard to encourage participation from the crowd in using crowdsourcers mm. or you have to have a dedicated community that already knows that they're going to be that are already excited about sharing their ideas using the crowdsourcer but it's difficult to make something go viral and i can cite examples of how that didn't work with say the eu's futurium project which wanted to crowdsource something and so you have the same issues with crowdsourcing that you do with survey research, which is really um, getting a good sample size. Mm -hmm. um, you have interesting other pro problems with gaming, like the interactive games, like um, the online games like Urgent Evoke or Superstruct or um, some of the, the IFTF Foresight Engine games, is that they assume that people have a lot of time to be online playing the game. So one of the things that we do need to maybe think about doing if we create a list of here are some methods or tools or resources or approaches is sort of say, this is what you have to have to make it work. Mm. And this is and, and, and here's what you can get out of it if it works well. And here are some downsides, you know, be aware of them mm. um, because it it's. Uh, it's it, almost almost everything that we can talk about in terms of encouraging participation is going to have some barrier because if it were easy, we would be doing it all the time. I mean, and we should get to the point where where we are doing it all the time. But I, I think it's a, a participation. Encouraging participation is in, it, is in itself a skill that mm. needs to be mm. acquired. Mm -hmm. And I think that connects back to the, was it Ian who was saying, we need to work on our communications in Futures and Foresight, because we don't always get the, the message or the idea across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any comments on that? And just to say, uh, well, and, and this is all emerging, you know, because now we have WhatsApp groups, uh, but they're very secure. Uh, we have Facebook groups, which are very not secure. So a lot of people are researching with Facebook groups and Twitter feeds and so on. And Can I just intervene here for a second, Joe? So uh, this is now uh, 1759. <laughs> so uh, it is just one minute before the uh, official ending of the session. Sure. Uh, I just would like to actually thank to everyone uh, who participated today, who gave excellent speeches, and who also helped us actually to run these uh, sessions. There's the big team behind it um, uh, from the uh, Institute. And also we have a, uh, translators who have been working hard since this morning. Mm. So um, now it's a good time probably to 
let them to finish the day because they will continue working tomorrow and the day after with the same speed. Um, so many thanks to them. So in, I mean, at this point, so the, um, uh, the, there's the YouTube live connection was also going, so live broadcasting, so that will also be stopped and the translation will also be uh, stopped, so interpretation. So thanks to them, uh, but we have the liberty to continue as much as we want, as long as we want. So the teams will be available and open. I think your whiteboard is available and open. So um, yeah, we can keep going. Mm. Yeah, okay. thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Oshjan. So, uh, well, basically, uh, thank you, translators. Uh, I didn't realize they were working all this time, actually. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, in, in Russian. Great. Uh, 